you so much for tuning in live to Inside the Huddle, brought to you by myself, Jake Ushinowskis, coming from West Hartford Town Hall. On May 17th, 2018, uh, lots to get into today, from sports gambling to baseball, the NBA draft, the MLB draft, how sports intertwine and how they vary in multiple ways. So definitely a lot of things to tune into and to decipher. I uh, wanted to get right off the bat with sports gambling <clears throat> and the legalizing of it just a couple of days ago. Personally, from my perspective, it's a terrible thing to legalize because sports gambling, <clears throat> it never, was good for society, for athletes, anyone involved. There, anytime money is on the line, there's a lot of desperate measures that are taken, including, including rigging games, uh, players betting on themselves or against themselves. And it really takes away from the integrity of the sport. And all fans, including myself, we watch because we would like to believe the integrity of the sport is picture perfect, where it you know includes all genuine, authentic plays from everyone involved, not anything tainted. That's when we start to question the validity of it. So because of the fact that the sports gambling has been legalized, <clears throat> that gives athletes and more people involved reason to participate. And at the same time, the NBA has already been caught with officials rigging games and being involved in sports gambling, such as Tim Donahue. Uh, it's happened before, it'll happen again. And this just allows more loop loopholes, not even loopholes, it allows more freedom because there aren't any loopholes that have to be taken to gamble now. So it definitely makes it easier and increases the percentage of people that will participate. You can only hope that those people that participate are not involved in the actual events themselves. Otherwise, you're basically watching an event that's already predetermined. So as a sports fan, as someone that really think sports can be great to society. I think this is detrimental not only to society, but sports for some of the reasons I just mentioned, as well as sports gambling is an addiction. Gambling is an addiction. Uh, the more you win, the more you want to play, the chances are that you'll lose. So look, anyone is allowed to do their own choices in life and hats off to them. If they want to gamble, they can gamble. But the bottom line is it's they gambling is allowed and it's done by casinos for a reason. They often take home the vast majority of money and you keep having people come back to not only win more but to win what they lost in the first place. So it's really like a hamster on a wheel that goes round and round and they're not going anywhere because it's a lose-lose situation. So on that note, with giving advice on gambling and how it can affect the sports world, I wanted to change the tune to baseball with analytics. Look, I'm one of the bigger baseball fans I know in my life, objectively speaking. But something has to be said about analytics and how they're sincerely ruining the game and the sport that I've come to love since I was eight years old, about 17 years ago. So it's not really the fact that analytics are dumb. I think they have a place in the sport, in life. Anytime you have numbers, they can certainly be used, looked at to determine how you want to approach the future. I get that. But at the same time, if they're used too significantly, it takes away the entertainment, it takes away the fun, it takes away why we watch. We don't watch 
So Ivy League uh, graduates can come and dictate how a sport should be played, how philosophies should be changed and radicalized almost a hundred years later into the sports history. That's nonsense. And what you're seeing now is our baseball game is being decided by home runs, strikeouts, and an insane amount of hits being taken away by shifts. And baseball before, it was still treated very seriously. Teams were doing everything they could to win. But it's gotten to a point now where I was texting a friend the other day and I was saying, outside of watching the Yankees, I don't find myself watching other games because it's the same who hits the most homers, who strike at, who can total up the most strikeouts pitching wise. And that's not fun. You, you want to see the ball hit in play, but also where it's in the ballpark and it's not a foregone conclusion that's a home run right off the bat. Because if that's the case, then it, the ball in play isn't real action because it's inevitable when it's hit 400 feet, what the result's gonna be. You wanna see diving plays, you wanna see teams actually have to work for it instead of either two results, strikeouts, or home runs. Uh, because home runs are considered balls in play. And when there's a ball hit in play where the fielder doesn't move, it's hard to get excited about that. You want competition, you want unpredictable results. Hitting a ball 400 feet to score every run in the game isn't as much excitement as there used to be and as there could be. So <clears throat> with that being said, analytics are simply ruining the game. Uh, they're used the most in baseball compared to any other sport. I was watching the Astros the other week and they had a shift on Joey Gallo, who's a predominantly pole hitter. And the shift was basically all the infielders in an extreme shift on the right side of the infield slash outfield. And it was a disgrace because I know that the hitter has the right to hit the ball the other way and beat the shift, which he should. And I'll get to that as well. Joey Gallo should be able to hit the ball to the left side and get a single, a double, and be able to walk to first. And that's part of the aggravating part that I will put on the players is it's their job to counteract the shift that's being thrown against them. It, it wouldn't be as much of an issue, I wouldn't be talking about this, if they would have the wherewithal to bunt the ball down the third baseline and the shift would be gone within a couple of at-bats, not being applied every at-bat of the game. And I think that's the mind-knowing part is you don't have to be successful for the shift to be a race. If you attempt to bunt the ball down the third baseline, the infielders and the opposition, the opponent in other words, will have to respect that and alter their defensive approach. So I think that's what these players don't seem to understand. They don't believe that they can bunt the ball 90 feet, not even 90 feet, it can be 45 feet and they'll be safe but they don't have to even be successful. As long as you have to respect it, that's why I laugh when the commissioner or uh, anyone comes up with the notion that shifts should be banned. Well, no, that's pathetic. If you can't beat the shift, rather than just hitting it over the outfielder's head, but hitting it the other way, then you shouldn't be in the game. It's your job to figure out a way how to beat it, not have it handed to you in a cupcake fashion. You're a professional athlete, it's your job. If you're not gonna be able to problem solve and figure out what's the best way to counteract their strategy, then you're in the wrong sport, quite frankly. But bottom line is it's involving analytics, why the shifts are there, why the players are taking their chances trying to beat the ship and the definition of ins insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results and quite frankly the hitters trying to beat the ship rather than just swallowing their ego and being uh, swallowing their humility is just hitting the ball the other way and like i said 
I would understand if they continued to try and beat the shift if the shift weren't eliminated after they tried to bunt. But I can promise you this, Didi Gregorius tried to bunt three separate occasions. He got three hits on he got hits on each one of those occasions and they eliminated the shift. So as Didi has shown, if you can do three times of at least attempting to bunt, you won't have to worry about the shift ruining the way that the authentic authenticity of you as a hitter. The next part of the show that I think many of you will find interesting is steroids and baseball. When Robinson Cano got busted for PEDs two days ago, it was rather heartbreaking to a lot of Yankee fans, including myself. Uh, Robbie is a stand-up guy. He's done great things for the game before this. He's always been looked at as an ambassador, someone who has great poise, not only on the field, but off the field. He does a lot of charitable work. So you really can't point a bad finger at the guy off the field until he did the worst thing off the field that you can do in the game as far as baseball is concerned, and that's take steroids, uh, PEDs. He got caught with a masking agent, a diuretic that flushes all the PEDs out of your system, and he dropped his suspension. He dropped his appeal of his suspension that he appealed back in spring training, and 40 games into the season, he no longer found it a fight worth fighting. Now, if that doesn't tell you everything you need to know, I don't know what will. But the bottom line is Robinson Cano was found guilty in 13 years into his career. Uh, it's a real sad situation because all everyone's been talking about is <clears throat> were his years with the Yankees tainted? Would he be what he is today without steroids? And those are all fair questions. And unfortunately, we probably won't know the answers to them. You just have to go with how you view the player, the person, and if he goes into greater detail at a later time about when he started to take steroids, if he did take them dating back to his Yankee years, then everyone will have their entitled opinion to if he's telling the truth. But the fact is steroids have been a sticky situation in baseball for a while, and I find it rather amusing that once Robinson Cano gets busted for steroids that everyone says it's a dark part to the game of baseball when it's been a dark aspect to the sport going back two decades really since McGuire and Sosa ended their home run chase and baseball tried to act all high and mighty uh, I blame baseball for allowing it in the first place because by putting up all these astronomical numbers players kids everyone who has affection towards the game of baseball felt that if they wanted a future in the sport the best way to do it was steroids and baseball allowed it they didn't stomp on the bug when they had the chance to they let it get legs and crawl and crawl and crawl until it became universal in the sport, which it essentially is. Let's be honest, Robinson Cano is not the only player in baseball to be taking steroids, and I'm sure there will be more to come out, especially in the next couple of years. Whether that's in the next couple of weeks, we'll have to wait and see, but Robinson Cano is not the only one taking steroids, and unfortunately, I can't blame the others for doing that. I blame Robinson Cano because his situation it just doesn't make sense. You have the world's best doctors in the United States. He said he went to a licensed doctor in the Dominican Republic. I get that's his home, his heritage. Why are you going to the Dominican Republic <coughs> when you have team doctors who are licensed, they're right there, and you, you're being paid $25 million a year So 
the whole doctor in the Dominican Republic, it just makes me think he knew what he was doing because it's as simple as just going to any doctor that's well regarded in the United States to get a simple answer. You don't have to go to the Dominican. I think he tried to use that to validate his actions by going to see a licensed doctor and having it turn out that he put an illegal substance in his body. So another part I don't get is he was set for life. He was making 25 million a year. He's losing 11 million by missing 80 games. So what I don't get is you already have your contract, you're set for life. It's pure ego why he's taking steroids and it really ruined a whole lot that makes it seem totally not worth the risk from his legacy to we'll see how he is as a player when he comes back. That's the part that a lot of people will weigh and see on is, is he close to the same type of player, assuming he's not on steroids? And also, the Seattle Mariners, they have to feel like Cano made a fraudulent move to them as a franchise. You pay someone that much money, you're expecting integrity, as we touched up earlier on the show, and you're expecting the utmost honesty to live up to that contract, and Cano did the exact opposite. It puts them in a tough position. Uh, they're basically left to hang without a real second baseman for the next half of the season up until August 14th when Cano is eligible to be reinstated. And even if they were to make the playoffs, they're not allowed to get their second baseman back, their all-star perennial second baseman. So it certainly makes life a whole lot tougher on them because they were off to a good start this season, contending for the wild card. And then you find out on Sunday that your starting second baseman suffers a broken hand only a day later to find out that he suspended 80 games, even longer than a broken hand would take to recover. So they're certainly in a not so envious position. It just makes you wonder how selfish Cano could be. Asking agent. It wasn't a PED that After seeing Melky Cabrera's good friend get caught, and A-Rod twice. I mean, A-Rod was suspended a full year. The next time A-Rod got caught would have been a lifetime ban. It just doesn't make sense. When Cano was with the Yankees, he saw all this happening, yet he decided it was worth the risk, which is truly mind-boggling. And it really sums up the type of person he was in this situation. He was flirting with fire, he was being dangerous when he didn't have to be and shouldn't have been. Because if you ask the average baseball fan, Robinson Cano is a good player with or without steroids, period. He is. He has the hitting knowledge, he has the hitting skills. He would be a very reliable and useful player, even right now, without steroids. It's just the fact he decided it was worth it with all the money, with all at stake for the team, the organization, and his fans. It's mind-boggling. And that's why I say there should be a one-and-done policy in baseball because even though you're risking the chance of a great player being vanished from the game entirely if he got caught, it would eliminate so many more players from taking that chance. If you just put the pedal to the metal and said, hey, here's everything you need to know. If you get caught like Robinson Cano, there are no ifs, ands, or buts, you are out of the game. And that would do a lot more good than harm, in my opinion. Yes, there would be some people who might have great talents that would be foolish enough to try it, but if you're really serious about getting this dark cloud past the game and opening up the sun, the sunshine and having this game be looked at in a very positive manner, I think that's how you have to approach. You have to be more aggressive, more hard. Three times to be banned from baseball 
uh, you have to be tested three times positively before you are banned. That's an utter joke because any person with uh, any type of rain would know that if you're taking it three times while being caught, you shouldn't be in the sport and you're not going to get caught three times if you have any clue at how, how to hide it. One time is one thing, two times is another, but three entirely different. So I think at worst, two times needs to be the bare minimum for being expelled from the game of baseball. And um, quite frankly, I don't look at the game any differently. I know athletes in all sports take steroids, which is really kudos to baseball for being so high on the list in all of sports with catching guys, penalizing players, and you never hear about nearly as much with the NFL, the NBA, and it really just goes to show you that right now, even though baseball opened this can of worms to, like I said, get legs, crawl, and really make this an issue in the first place, they've really done their job in the last 10 years or so. Uh, the first 10 years, which was about 20 years ago to 07, it was horrible. They didn't have any authority really, even though they should have had authority. And uh, the players were just controlling and ruining the game left and right. But now they've at least shown that, hey, we don't care who you are. If you break the rules, you're going to break them and get suspended. Now I just hope those rules are harsher and the penalties are more severe. Speaking of players, uh, the MLB draft is coming up in the early part of June. And with that being said, there's a lot of interesting parts to look at from the M MLB draft. You have the young players who are making their debuts and in professional baseball, out of college, out of high school. And the cool part that I was talking to my good, one of my good friends about was the fact that MLB players, when they make an early appearance in their career at age 21, age 20, like you're seeing Ronald Acuna, Ozzy Albies, <clears throat> they both made their debuts at 20. But the fact that I think a lot of people don't realize is how rare that is compared to other sports. Normally, if you see a baseball player at age 22, 23, they're still considered a prospect, even though they might have been in the minor leagues for two to three years. Uh, whereas in the NBA, a 23-year-old first-year player in the NBA is not considered a prospect. So I definitely think it's something to tip your hat to for the baseball players being able to basically accelerate that path to the major leagues as opposed to uh, an NBA player, an NFL player, because there's no farm systems in those sports. And I think with the MLB, one can debate how much a farm helps a player, if they should be thrown into the gauntlet, into the fire to start their careers. But you look at how many players that are 21, 20 right now, you have Glaber Torres, Ronald Acuna, Ozzy Albies, uh, Soroka on the Braves. You have a lot of young, extremely talented players, especially on Atlanta, that are taking the game by storm. And I definitely think that is a bright spot for the sport because not only are they young, but as I mentioned, the path they took there to really accelerate it, it just shows you how good they are and how good they can be down the road since they're in the majors at such an early process. Uh, my last point that I think should pair with this is you have, you have these young players and whether it's Vladimir Guerrero Jr., Glaber Torres, and they're all having seemingly effects on pennant races. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. should be up within the next month or two. And the Blue Jays are right in the thick of the wild card race. You have Shohei Otani, who is a pitcher for the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. He is leading them in the front spot of the AL wild card. 
So you definitely have a lot of talent that is young, that is being thrown into the fire, and who is really accelerating at a pace that I don't think many people could have anticipated for these rookies. So with that being said, it should be a great time next few months to evaluate if these rookies hit a wall, how they deal with it, and most importantly, how the teams use them in these situations. Do the Yankees and the Braves and the Angels, do they still use these young, talented rookies the same way when it gets down the stretch late in the year? Does Shohei Otani have an innings limit? Does Glaber Torres maintain the second base job throughout the year? Or will the pressure of New York get to him where if he goes into a slump, the fans will be questioning if he's ready? You know, it's only May in the baseball season, so there's still a lot to go. I know it's easy to get overwhelmed with potential and early success from rookies, but let's be honest, there's six months, there's going to be adversity for every each and every one of these players. So certainly is something to keep an eye on. And without further ado, I would like to say thank you very much for tuning in to Inside the Huddle, brought to you by Jake Ushinowskis. Thank you. Thank you.